Hi, I'm Vin with Boris Effects, and in this multi-part tutorial, I'm going to show you how to use all of the tools in your toolbox to create these sci-fi inspired warp titles. Now to create this, I'm going to be using a lot of different tools available to me, including Title Studio, Particle Array 3D, various filters for volumetric lighting, lens blurs, mocha masking, video glitch, and distortion filters. Basically, I'm going to be using Continuum, Mocha, Sapphire, quite literally the entire toolbox. But there's a lot going on here and I don't want to overload everything into one tutorial. So for now, I'm going to focus on creating the nebula alone. The title, lens flare, glitch, war, putting everything together, that's going to be in part two. And while I'm going to be creating this in After Effects, everything I do can easily be replicated in any host. The workflow might be slightly different, but this effect doesn't rely solely on AE cameras or masking or anything fancy like that. Now, if you'd like to follow along in AE, don't forget to download the project file and a free Nebula preset. So let's begin. To create my Nebula, I'm going to want to first create a new 1920 by 1080 composition and name it Nebula. Next, let's add a new black solid and call it Particles. In my Effects and Presets menu, I'm going to go to the BCC Particles unit and select Particle Array 3D. Drag that right onto my solid. So as the name suggests, Particle Array creates an array of particles. By default, I get this 10 by 10 grid of sphere particles. If I open up my built-in camera options and set the model to orbit, I can see that not only do I have a single array of 10 by 10 particles, I also have two other panels behind that. Adjusting the number of particles in the array and how many arrays are stacked will allow me to control the depth and detail of my final project. OK, let's reset this and start looking at how I get from this default array to something closer to my nebula. If I look back at the finished nebula, there are some things I can see right off the bat. Ignoring things like glows and blurs, which we'll cover in a bit, I can see that I have quite a lot of particles. Those particles fill the comp window, they're twisted into some interesting shapes, and there's a lot of motion as each strand of particles kind of whips around a little bit. Now rather than trying to recreate an exactly identical nebula at the moment, let's break down each subgroup that's necessary in building any kind of nebula. First off, I need to change the particle type. Nebulas are made up of dust and gas reflecting the light from distant stars, so let's begin by changing the particle type to points. There are a number of other options available, including user-generated images, but for my purposes, I'm going to go with points. Now I can adjust the color of my particles here, and I'll select a nice light blue. If I adjust the size, all of my particles will scale accordingly, with higher values resulting in larger particles. In this case, I want to pull that back as much as possible until I have these nice pinpoints. Now this is great, but I want my nebula to be made up of particles of varying sizes. Some larger, some smaller, some not even visible. To achieve this look, I can adjust the size variance parameter. As I increase it, more and more particles in my array are randomly sized between 0 and whatever the max size value is. So if I crank this all the way up to 100, all of my particles will have some sort of scale applied to them, with the largest being 10 and the smallest being 0. If I set it at 50, half of my particles will be scaled. Pretty cool. Now that I have my particles, I need to create more of them. To do this, I'm going to close the particle subgroup and open up the array subgroup. This is where I can control the number of particles in my array, how many arrays are stacked, and what the overall scale of that array is. I can also change the shape of my array from grids to spheres to boxes, and while each of these offers their own unique shape to work with, for my purposes, I'm going to stick with the default grid. To increase my particles, I can adjust the number along the X, Y, and Z planes individually. Changes to the number of X particles will increase or decrease the amount of particles in each row. Changes to the Y particles will increase or decrease the amount of particles in each column. And changes to the Z particles will increase or decrease the number of arrays stacked on top of each other. If I rotate my camera, you can see this here. As I increase my X and Y particles, each array responds accordingly. When I increase my Z particles, I'm not simply adding a few particles, I'm adding a whole new array on top of the existing one. Pay special attention to this because as I increase the number of arrays by increasing the Z particle parameter, I'm exponentially increasing the overall number of particles on screen. This can dramatically increase render time, so it's best to work with smaller values until you have things set up, then increase those values for your final render. 
All right, let's reset the camera again so that we're looking at this straight on and make some adjustments to our particle amounts. Now that's looking good. It's a nice balance that will let me get a feel for the nebula without dramatically increasing render times while I'm working with the rest of the settings. What I want to do now is scale the size of my array using the controls here. I can adjust the X and Y scale to stretch the array by increasing the distance between the columns or rows. I can also add depth by scaling the Z parameter, which will alter the distance between the array stacks. Of course, I can also adjust the master scale, which will adjust the relative scale between all particles at once. No matter what I change, my objective is to create an array that is much larger than my composition window, and you'll see why in just a moment. Okay, let's start shaping this into something less geometric and more natural. I'm going to close out my array group and start looking at the options to distort my grid. If I look back at my original nebula, I want to find ways to create motion and other distortions. In my parameter groups, I can see that I have a lot of options available to me to twist the array, shift it, and add fractal noise. I can also control how the particles are dispersed throughout the array. Let's begin by looking at that. At the moment, my array is built out of neat little particles all arranged in neat little lines. But just like how I added some variety to the particle size, I want to add some variety to this arrangement. By adjusting the Disperse Master, I can nudge those particles out of place. They're still in their rows and columns, but those lines are becoming less and less neat the more I push the dispersion. That said, I'm not going to push the dispersion too far, because I do want to retain a hint of the order beneath the chaos, so to speak. Here, I can take my array and twist it like I'm wringing out a washcloth. It will keep the same basic shape, but it can be folded and twisted along the X, Y, or Z planes. Now, there's no right or wrong way when creating your nebula as to which way to twist, so feel free to experiment. As for me, I'm partial to twisting along the Y axis. One thing to note is that the more you twist the array, the tighter it will get. Twist too much, and all the particles towards the center will crowd together, and you might lose the depth that you're looking for. Once I'm satisfied with my twisted array, there's another subgroup that I want to look at, the shift subgroup. This is just a simple group that allows me to shift the center point of my twist, this is completely optional, of course, but it's a nice way to offset the symmetry and framing of my effect. Now, in order to create some motion, let's move over to the Fractal Noise group. Although there are a number of parameters here, the main ones we want to focus on are the amplitude and frequency. Fractal Noise creates waves that ripple through the array. By increasing the amplitude, I can increase the size of the waves, while frequency controls how close together each wave is. Both can be adjusted globally or along the X, Y, and Z axes. Let's increase the global amplitude to create some waves, but I want to pull back on the frequency. The idea here is to create larger waves that are further apart from each other, giving the appearance of a rippling liquid. If I pull back on the frequency X parameter, I can create even longer waves that spread out along the rows of my array. Now while amplitude and frequency control how high and far apart each wave is, they don't control the speed of the waves. To adjust that, I want to change the auto-evolve speed. Lower values will slow down the movement, whereas higher values will speed it up. Since the movement in a dust cloud isn't typically quick, pulling back on the auto-evolve speed will create slower, more spacey waves. That's looking pretty good. Now there are a couple of other options that we can look at to change the type of waves that are moving through the array. Noise Character offers a selection of styles for wave movement. Wavy, spiky, lumpy. My personal favorite is whippy. This style, rather than pushing the wave through the whole array, anchors the initial point, then pushes the wave along the x-axis, much like wind causing a flag to billow. Very cool. If I want to add even more texture and variation, I can increase the variance. As with the size variance, the variance offset here offsets each wave slightly so that they are not all moving at the same time and speed. If I play that back, it's starting to look closer to my nebula. Let's add a little bit of camera motion to really sell this. Now there are two ways to do this. As I mentioned before, this project is not exclusive to After Effects, but if I am working exclusively in After Effects, I can create a new camera, the default is fine, then I can select the Use Comp Camera from my Effects panel. Particle Array will now use the camera I created. I can select my Orbit Tool and move around in 3D space, and I can also adjust the depth of field. Particle Array 3D is fully integrated with AE's camera and lighting system, so I have complete control over everything from inside of AE. I can create null objects and expressions, whatever I want to do. But, as I mentioned, this is not an exclusive project to After Effects. 
So if I'm working in another host like Premiere or Resolve or Avid, I'm not gonna have access to these AE specific features. Fortunately, this isn't a problem since Particle Ray has full camera control built right into it. Let me show you. First off, let's delete this AE camera and turn off the Use Comp Camera. I'm gonna go down to my built-in camera subgroup and change the camera model to Orbit. Here, I have full control over my field of view, spin, tumble, and rotations. I can create motion by clicking the stopwatch to set a keyframe. So for example, if I wanted to add a little spin and tumble, I can add keyframes at the beginning, move to the end, and adjust the spin, tumble, and even Z position. I can also enable depth of field, which will allow me to determine which part of the nebula is in focus. By setting the focal distance and aperture, I can push the particles closest and furthest from the camera out of focus. In photography, the focal distance is how far away from the camera the object in focus is, while aperture is how wide the camera iris is and how much light is reaching the camera sensor. The higher the aperture value, the smaller the iris and the less light reaching the camera. Larger apertures produce a larger depth of field, which in turn has more objects in focus, while smaller apertures produce a shallower depth of field and fewer objects are in focus. Now feel free to experiment on your own to create some unique and organic designs. For now, what I'm going to do is work with the original Nebula pattern by loading a saved preset. This will allow me to more easily demonstrate how to replicate the look of the original Nebula. This preset is also available for you to download for use with this tutorial or to use on your own. Once my preset is loaded, I want to start adding glows and color to it. Fast Film Glow is my go-to for this kind of project, so I'm going to drag that right onto my solid. Since there's not a lot to work with, I'm going to have to crank that intensity way up. But since I only want the streams to glow here, I need to pull back on the glow radius and increase my threshold. I can play around with it until I get something that looks pretty much like this. Next, let's create some volumetric lighting. This is a nebula after all, and we want to see some light filtering through the dust. To do this, I'm going to create a new adjustment layer and name it Rays. To this, I want to go to the Light category and select Rays Puffy. This is a fun one that creates some nice light rays around the particles. By changing the look to Tight Bloom, I can keep the glow tightly linked to my individual particles. While I'm at it, let's change the color to a nice blue-yellow. Now as with the nebula itself, I want to add a bit of movement. So I'm going to set a keyframe at the very beginning for my light source and position it over here on the left. While I'm at it, I'm also going to set a keyframe for the ray length, maybe somewhere around 40. On the last frame of my project, I'm going to move my light source to the right a little bit, and you know what, let's increase that ray length. Not too much. All I really want to do here is create the illusion that the nebula is moving past a light source, for example a star. By slightly increasing my ray length, the light appears to be refracted through more dust. Now one cool thing I can do is set a keyframe about a second in for the intensity. I'm going to crank that up, and then at random points, I'm just going to adjust the intensity up and down slightly. It's entirely optional, but it helps sell the idea that the dust and gas are traveling in front of the light, reducing the amount that passes through the nebula. Okay, now let's create a new adjustment layer and name it Color Glow. I want to create regions where the light gets red shifted. Maybe the light is interacting with hydrogen or methane in our nebula, so the visible light in those areas is a different part of the spectrum. So to do this, I'm going to first want to go to the Stylize unit and apply Colorize Glow. Let's bring up that intensity a bit so I can see it, and then what I want to do is create this fuzzy, grainy, dusty look. I'm not going to worry about the whole image, I'll mask that in a moment, but what I want to do is move my CTI to a point where these regions here are as bright as they're going to be. By adjusting the blur amount, I can create a softer or harsher glow. Since I want to create areas where the dust and gas are more noticeable, I'm going to set my blur amount to around 8 or 9, and then I'm just going to completely get rid of the spread amount. Since I want this glow confined to the stream of light and gas, let's just pull back on the threshold so that more of this region is affected by our glow. Now as I mentioned before, I want a softness here that isn't smeary or distorted. I don't want it to look like I just slapped a glow on top of my image. I want it to look like the glow is a natural result of dust scattering the light. To do this, I'm going to adjust the overdrive amount. This parameter adjusts the overall intensity of the glow. Lower values produce a softer glow by mixing the image, our nebula, with the original glow. Bringing it down a bit will give it a nice soft look. And speaking of softness, if I bring that down to around, say, 10, I can retain the sharpness of my light, but really give the appearance that those pinpoints of light are being scattered before they reach the camera. 
and that's looking pretty good. Okay, so as I mentioned, I want to mask out some of these areas so that the whole thing isn't an orangey glow. Now, since I'm in After Effects, I can certainly grab my pen tool and just start creating a generic mask, animate its path, and feather it out to blend, and that's going to work just fine. But as I mentioned earlier, if I'm not in After Effects, or if, say, someone on my team is in Premiere or Resolve, much like with the AE camera, I want to find a way to make this effect as compatible as possible. As it happens, in most of the effects available through Continuum or Sapphire, I have access to Mocha Pixel Chooser. Now this is both different and similar to Mocha AE, in which it allows me to do masking and tracking, but in this case, it's built right into the individual effect. So to access it and begin masking, all I have to do is launch Mocha right here. When Mocha launches, I'll take my X-Spline tool and draw a quick mask around this region here. Then I can create a new mask as a separate track over here. One quick tip is that if you want to move the screen area, just hold X to bring up the hand tool so you can move around without disconnecting your spline. Now if I want, I can select a spline track, Command A to select all the points, and move it around a bit to create some subtle movement. I want to be careful not to create keyframes too close together, or the mask will awkwardly jump around. Nice, smooth, subtle animation is what we're going for. Now if you're asking why this is better than using, for example, the AE mask, it's because I can go up here and just export my mask and tracking data. Now anyone on my team who's not working in AE can access and import these masks. When I'm done, I'll just save out. Now to get rid of these harsh mask edges, all I have to do is open up my Pixel Chooser mask, and like with After Effects, just adjust the feathering to blend it in nicely. There we go. All right, let's do something cool. I'm going to create a new adjustment layer and name it Lens Blur. To this layer, I'm going to add Fast Lens Blur. So what I want to do is create some subtle bokeh around the bright points of the light. To do that, I need to pull back a lot on this blur and drop my iris scale to something small, like 2. To create the bokeh, I can reduce my bokeh parameter while increasing the shading as high as possible. This is going to create these little hexagonal shapes around the bright pinpoints. Now if I want to change that shape, I can simply do that here in the iris shape dropdown. It's pretty simple. So this is cool, but I don't want my whole effect to be blurred out. What I want to do is mask this, and here's another reason why I like using Pixel Chooser in this instance. I'm going to launch Mocha, and then without doing anything else, I'm going to go up here, select Merge Project, load the mask that I saved earlier, and there we go. The masks and tracking data I created for Colorize Glow are now available to me in Lens Blur. Save it out, feather it, voila! And of course, if I were using a simple After Effects mask, I could simply just copy and paste the mask path. But like I said, if the rest of my team is in another host like Premiere, this is the quickest and easiest way to keep everyone on the same page. Okay, one last thing to really make this pop. Let's create a new adjustment layer and call it Vector. To this, I'm going to add FEC Vector Blur. Now, FEC is a product that, like Continuum and Sapphire, is available for download from Boris FX. If you don't have it, you can always use After Effects native CC Vector Blur, but the advantage to using FEC Vector Blur is that it is available in any host. Whatever version you decide to use, all we need to do is increase the amount a bit, between, say, 5 and 10. The thing I love about Vector Blur is that it can very quickly and easily create these electric tendrils. Now, I want to be careful because too much blur will make my nebula look like frosted glass, which is a cool look in and of itself, but it's not what I want to use here. That's looking pretty good. So with all of these effects layered, and depending upon how many particles you used and the amount of vector blur, we can start seeing some increases in render time. If everything is the way I want it, typically I'm just going to render this out before moving into a new comp to start work on other effects. But if I expect that I'm going to need to tweak things, I'll just pre-compose everything. How you decide to proceed is up to you, but for now, for creating this nebula, that's all there is to it. I'm Vin Morreale with Boris FX, and for more great tutorials, including part two, don't forget to check out the Boris FX website. Take care.